Hey guys, Josh from SoccerReviewsForYou.com, bringing you the five things that I hate about Nike, specifically in regards to the soccer slash football department. Now, just a quick disclaimer, I do not hate Nike as a brand. I think they make very good products. I think that in terms of performance in general, they're one of the best companies out there. With that being said, there are certain things about the brand that I don't care for as much, and that's what I'm gonna be focusing on in today's video. So without further ado, let's get right into the five things that I hate about Nike. ACC All Conditions Control. This is something that has been around for a little while now. It's pretty well known that this is a feature that you're gonna get on all the top end products from Nike, at least their high end footwear. And for those that don't know what it is, it's essentially marketed as a wet control element. With that being said, unlike a lot of soccer technologies, you can't actually see all conditions control. It's completely invisible. They just give you the promise that any shoe with all conditions control is gonna offer better grip on the ball in wet weather playing conditions. Hence, all conditions control. You're gonna have the same level of control in any playing conditions. With that being said, and this is something that I've made videos on in the past, there's really no way to test out whether or not ACC is actually doing anything for you. And what I've always found very interesting is that even though pretty much all the top end models have all conditions control, the amount of grip on the ball you're going to get in wet weather which each with each of their different shoes is going to be different. It has a lot more to do with the actual material and finish of the upper as opposed to ACC, which like I said, is one of those features that's completely invisible. So for those of you that really buy into that all conditions control feature and how it's going to improve your performance in wet weather, for me, it's more of a marketing gimmick than anything. And there's really no way to prove whether or not it's doing anything at all. And if I'm completely honest with you guys, I just don't think that it is doing anything. One little quick story that I wanted to tell you guys is that going back to the launch of the CTR360 Maestri 3 from Nike, the yellow and black ones, uh, that was the launch colorway, I actually got invited to Nike World Headquarters in Oregon, and uh, it was for the Maestri 3. Uh, the day that we got to actually try the shoes. It was super, super nice. We were at the Nike Fields, um, which are really high quality. It was a super sunny day, no water whatsoever. Everything was completely dry. But what they had us do is put the shoes on and then they had a little water sprayer that they gave to everybody and had us spray the shoes and then go and play just to see how good all conditions control was working because that was the first shoe to feature ACC. I thought it was a really goofy thing to do back then. And ever since then, it's something that has kind of bothered me about Nike's marketing department in general. It's a lot of trickery in my opinion. And if you are buying a Nike top end model, buy it for the features that you want from that specific shoe aside from ACC. I really don't view that as a major feature from the brand whatsoever. Inconsistent sizing is something that I think has always been a little bit silly from Nike. Uh, obviously, when you're going from running shoes to basketball shoes to soccer shoes, whatever it may be, different sports are gonna have different fits within their footwear. So I expect there to be slight sizing variation when you go from different types of shoes. But with that being said, if you're talking about just their soccer cleats, I really feel like they should all have the same sizing and that is not the case. You have the Mercurial line and the Hypervenom line that run true to size, and then you have the Tiempo line and the Magista line that run a half size small. And I just feel like that's something that's a little bit annoying. I think as the average consumer who's looking to buy a Nike product, you shouldn't have to do your research on specific models within the brand from different lines to see how the sizing works. I think it's much better, especially for a big brand like Nike, if all of their lines at least have the same sizing. They don't necessarily have to have the same shape and the same width, but sizing should be the same. The length of the shoe should be the same from line to line, and quite simply, it is not. Is that something that they could fix? Sure it is, but at this point in time, because it's been such a thing for such a long time now, I would think that if they did finally make all of the silos have the same sizing, it would screw a lot of people up, and again, you'd have a big mess. It would fix things long-term, but short-term, it would not be a good thing. So for me, inconsistent sizing, something that's fairly inexcusable from a big brand like Nike. The push for mid-cut soccer cleats. This is something that's become a recent trend that Nike pretty much started with the original Nike Magista Obra, then we got the Superfly 4, then we got the Hypervenom Phantom 2, now we're on the Superfly 5 and the Obra 2. 
all mid cut shoes. This has been the latest craze in high end soccer shoes. And to a certain extent, I don't have a problem with the mid cut aspect of the top end models. I guess with the Hyper Venom Phantom 2, it's it's an aspect of that particular shoe that's slightly unnecessary. The Hyper Venom Finish has the exact same upper. It's more lightweight and I would argue fits more comfortably than the Phantom 2. And it's not mid cut. Again, just no need for the mid cut Phantom 2. But now we're seeing takedown models with mid cut designs that they're charging more money for. It's a major premium over the regular low cut takedown models that they're still offering as well. I get it if you're gonna make all of your takedown models mid cut and leave the prices kind of as more standard takedown prices, but if you're gonna have your standard takedown prices with the low cut versions and then charge a $40 premium for a mid cut variation that offers no performance benefit whatsoever and arguably doesn't fit as well as the low cut one, I just think that that's something that's really, really unnecessary. I don't like the fact that they're trying to kind of capitalize on the popularity of mid-cut shoes at the lower price points and kind of enticing people to spend more money on something that doesn't offer any kind of performance benefit at all because ultimately these mid-cut collars yes it gives the shoe a certain look but it doesn't improve performance in any way at all so again i don't necessarily have a problem with them making mid-cut high-end models but charging 170 dollars for a takedown that to me is a little bit too much Change for the sake of change is something that I think a lot of big companies can be, uh, I guess, liable of to a certain extent. But with Nike, we see this a lot, mainly with their top end models when they do upgrades. I think a great example would be the Vapor 10 to the Vapor 11. A lot of people really like the Vapor 10. I personally think it's one of the best mercurial vapors that Nike ever put out. It had a super thin Tasian synthetic upper. It was the first one to feature a one piece design. It was a very lightweight shoe. It fit extremely well. It had a lot going for it that a lot of people really, really liked. With the release of the Vapor 11, while I think they improved upon the shoe with the addition of that Nike plate sole plate, they added unnecessary texturing to the upper they made it thicker than it needed to be it's definitely thicker than what we got from the vapor 10 and while ultimately i think the vapor 11 does perform better there are certain aspects about the vapor 10 that didn't need to be modified going into the vapor 11 the hypervenom is another great example of this and something that nike ended up actually having to change halfway through its run because a lot of people just weren't down for this new hypervenom redesign the phantom one while it had its flawed of flaws, it was very successful because of that honeycomb mesh based Nike skin upper that they straight up took away with the release of the second generation Hypervenom. They now gave it back to us, but it wasn't until they made that change just to do something a little bit different that they realized that they should have just stuck with something that they had going that was very, very good. There's lots of examples that you could think of with Nike in this particular situation, but that's something that I've always been a little bit, um, bothered about when it comes to Nike is that they have something really, really good. You can improve upon that design by making subtle changes, but more often than not, Nike will opt to do really big changes versus subtle changes, which might lead to a really good shoe, but at the same time, those changes weren't entirely necessary. The price of high-end soccer cleats are undoubtedly getting higher and higher, especially over the last couple of years. And often Nike tends to be the main trendsetter when it comes to these major price hikes. A great example of this would be the Nike Magista Obra and the Nike Mercurial Superfly 4. Prior to the launch of those shoes, 200, 220, 240 was kind of the max that you were gonna pay for a top end model from any brand. But given that Nike knew that there was gonna be a lot of hype and excitement around these two brand new knitted mid cut models, kind of first ever style shoes, they decided to introduce the price point of $275. They then introduced the Phantom 2 at that price point and then released the Superfly 5 and the Obra 2 at $300, even higher. What did this do? Obviously this means that consumers would have to pay a lot more for Nike top end products, but it also caused other brands to follow them and kind of match their price points. Because what a lot of people don't necessarily pick up on is that when you have competing brands like Nike and Adidas, for example, Adidas wants to have similar price points to Nike to have kind of competing models. If Nike has a $300 shoe and Adidas's top end model is $200, a lot of people automatically 
assume that the more expensive shoe is going to be better. I know that sounds stupid, but that is how a lot of these prices are set. So because Nike went up to $300, Adidas went up to $300, Puma is now at $300, and we're likely gonna see a lot more of this in terms of these big brands kind of duking it out when it comes to making the prices as high as possible, while still maintaining sales levels that they deem to be, uh, I guess, good enough for their standards. You have to keep in mind that the majority of these sales and the majority of the profits brands are making on their I guess footwear in this particular situation is not from the top end products. They're selling far more takedown models at $80 than they are top end models at $300. But for soccer enthusiasts, like people who are, I assume are watching this channel, it just means that you're gonna have to pay a lot more for top end products. And like I said, often the trendsetter when it comes to these major price hikes, unfortunately, it tends to be Nike. All right guys, so that is it for the five things that I hate about Nike. Let me know what you guys thought of this concept for a video. Is it something you'd like to see more of, perhaps with other brands? Would you like to hear the five things that I love about Nike? That's something that's definitely doable. Let me know your feedback down below in the comment section. And of course, if you have any kind of things to add of your own in terms of your own thoughts or any questions regarding anything that I talked about in this video, leave that down below in the comment section and I definitely will get an answer out to you. If you enjoyed today's video, found it helpful and informative, be sure to support it with a like. Subscribe if you haven't already for daily videos on all the latest and greatest soccer gear. You can find all of my social media information linked down below in the description as well. And other than that guys, hope you enjoyed today's video and as always, thanks for watching.